Hey, Jeff, uh, thank you for coming in today. You've got this marvelous background. You've got this uh, tremendous penetration on the investment side, but you also have this legal experience on the compliance side and so on in, in corporate finance. Uh, and uh, you're a director with the, these, the pharmaceutical industry. So it's kind of a remarkable background, not to mention you're judging this, probably the world's largest sustainable AI innovation program in the world, or I should say you're um, a mentor and you're also uh, part of ju judging process uh, in that program. Anyways, we'll cover all of these different aspects of your career. So I really appreciate you coming in. Oh, thank you for having me, Stephen. So Jeff, you know, my, my audience, and I track it, by the way, the number one um, viewers of my, of my interviews and the work I do is actually CEOs and founders. And then there's investors, sovereign funds, and then it's people like professors and, and engineers. But really, it's always executives at the very top, including investors. So, um, and they're always curious, you know, what, what are those two or three inflection points in your life that made this sort of wonderful career that you're having and will continue to have? And it could be something that happened when you're really young, uh, you know, four or five to something happened in school, university to maybe uh, inflection points in your career. So, you know, I would characterize uh, the inflection points as really a magnification of, of my viewpoint um, as my career has has sort of broadened. Um, you know, I, I'm a, uh, a lawyer by training. Um, and, you know, in the legal field, you've got a, a fairly narrow viewpoint. You know, things are, are somewhat black and white and you are placed within a box. Um, and, you know, that was just sort of uh, how I viewed the world for a number of years before moving over to the, the, uh, the TSX Venture Exchange, which is probably the, uh, the largest uh, sort of junior exchange in the world, um, a, a few thousand uh, listed companies. Um, and, you know, there I got a, a good sense of um, markets, uh, of public perception, um, and of, of just sort of uh, taking a broader view of, of how um, my actions impacted a number of people. You know, in, in the legal field, you're, you're constantly acting in the best interest of your client without really having um, a, a broader viewpoint for, you know, how what you're doing might impact the largest market. Um, at the, the exchange, you know, the uh, scope was broadened. Um, market impact was certainly considered when making decisions, um, and and then you know I, I suppose the uh, the third or the second inflection point is uh, joining Reds. Um, you know we're a a global VC group. Uh, we've got partners all across the world. We've got investments all across the world, and and investors uh, for that matter. Um, all of whom are interested in, in impact and what we're doing um, and how what we can do will impact uh, the world for, for years to come. And that really served as, um, um, you know, an awakening, I, I suppose, um, in that, you know, I got a great sense of, of uh, the impact that investments can make, that investors can make, and, and you know, individuals for that matter. So Jeff, you know, you, you talk about how the legal aspect, uh, you know, really took hold for you and uh, that shaped the first part of your life. So, you know, when you're young, you have so many choices. You can go into a science or you can go into straight business. What made you want to go into law? Because law is not an easy area and requires typically multiple degrees. Like you get an undergrad, then you get... Uh, then you go for uh, a law degree, and, and and a law degree is really a difficult journey. So, you know, growing up, uh, reading and, and writing were always my strengths. Um, you know, I, I'd uh, always been able to put together a fairly persuasive argument uh, in in any situation. Um, you know, conversely, math and science were, um, you know, not the best for me. <laughs> you know, so it, it typically an un-Asian upbringing. Um, so, you know, I, I did my, uh, BA in, in poli sci, uh, sort of typical route to law school. I'd, I'd always sort of known that, uh, law was where I wanted to be, um, not because I wanted to be a lawyer, but because of the versatility that it would allow me, uh, in my career moving forward. 
So, um, you know, I, I went through uh, the training, um, worked at uh, one of the biggest firms in the world or the pre predecessor to uh, one of the biggest firms in the world currently. There's been a, a large wave of um, amalgamation, uh, particularly in the Canadian uh, legal field, specialized in securities law and then uh, moved on and up in my career. That's interesting. I, I mean, poli sci is really a interdisciplinary uh, sort of field. I mean, you covered different aspects, and um, that would lend itself well to being a fund manager, um, being interdisciplinary, uh, you know, working across and understanding and really being curious about different areas. And then I guess law too, and 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 this aspect of a lot of reading, right? Exactly. You know, you you have to. To be in love with uh, the, the printed word, <laughs> uh, but but not only that, you you have to be able to understand multiple points of view, bring in diverse perspectives, and then really sort of weigh the best uh, path forward, considering all of the the various considerations that that uh, comprise a uh, you know final decision. So law would then give you the basis because you, as you indicated, you're looking at different uh, points of view. And there's this idea of the theory of the mind, which some of these uh, large language models, large foundation models, they're saying exhibiting this theory of the mind is understanding somebody else's perspective, you know, shaping your behavior to that other person's perspective. So, and then this gets into something called EQ. So it, it must mean you must have high EQ, right? I try, I try. Um, you know, when we're we're dealing with with people in, you know, whether it's it's you know with our fund, uh, whether it's in real life, you know, I, I try my best to understand their motivations. Um, of course, I've got an understanding of, of our motivations, my motivations, and try to craft a, a win win scenario for for all parties involved. You know, it, it's it's always better, and and everybody else feels better when you know they they feel as though they've obtained something from a transaction, from, you know, a conversation, what have you, um, you know, a, a sort of a win-lose is is the less optimal solution. So it sounds like that's really a, uh, a success uh, recommendation you would give to other people, right? Or, you know, understand other people's perspective and, and that'll make you more effective. And in fact, there's this correlation between EQ, this emotional quotient and lifelong success, right? Absolutely, absolutely, yes. You know, and and the the sort of the the last thing you want to do is um, try to um, annoy somebody else, and, and you know, have them not have a great um, or leave them with a, a less than stellar impression of of you as as a person, as a business person, um, because you don't know how uh, you know how, how far reaching their networks are, how trust will be impacted. And, um, you know, it's just how future dealings um, will be sort of impacted by whatever decision you're making in your own best interest at the moment. And I guess this would extend if you have children or, or, or friends or wives or partners and whatever, right? So <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay, now in your career, you were involved with corporate finance and compliance and disclosure groups at the uh, TSX uh, Venture Exchange. Can you describe what that work entails? Sure. So the corporate finance work is uh, basically um, attracting listings from private companies looking to access public money. So um, it's a, a process by which you undertake a fairly thorough due diligence um everything from you know legal to finance to um whatever product or piece of property uh you are are trying to to monetize gets scrutinized um and then it, it's uh put to an investment committee very similar to what we're doing these days in in reds but um you know it, it's um you know fairly thorough process and, and I oversaw a good number of deals um, brought them to to public markets and uh, allowed them to access uh, financing. You know, conversely, on the uh, the compliance side, it's maintaining um, public um, confidence in the markets, 
reviewing disclosure that uh, these companies are required to make by uh, by statute and uh, ensuring that um, there is integrity in, in the marketplace. So you're also a director in a pharmaceutical company and its subsidiary. What, what does that mean? You know, what do pharmaceutical companies focus on and these ones in particular? And what is the role of a director? So I am a uh, director of uh, the TSX venture listed company, uh, Quest Pharmatech. It is a uh, company that is involved in oncology research. We've got a phase 2B study occurring right now um, uh, it, you know, with uh, um, sort of uh, studies occurring across Asia, North America, um, and I believe in, in Europe as well. Um, you know, we are close to um, uh, getting our ducks in a row for uh, for phase three or an acquisition. Um, but, you know, it, it's um, it, it's a very exciting uh, and worthwhile uh, endeavor. Um, you know, the, the team is led by an incredible uh, researcher who's had a, a 20 plus year history of, of innovation. Um, and as a director, I serve as a, um, a sober second thought. Um, yeah for this, this, uh, this individual, um, you know, the, the, uh, the entire board is comprised of, of some remarkable individuals with, uh, deep expertise across a number of domains. And really what we bring is, um, an interdisciplinary approach to, um, decision-making, um, you know, we're, we're not involved in the day-to-day. -day. However, if there is a decision, um, of some significance, the CEO will bring it to the board. We will uh, sort of talk it out, assess the pros and cons, and then advise the uh, CEO as to the best uh, course of action. Um, I am heading both the audit and, uh, or no, sorry, the um, the compensation and governance committees currently. Um, there's a little bit of extra work around um, corporate uh, compliance and, and um, some of the, the finance work as well. But uh, everybody is pushing towards the same goal, and you know it's been a very worthwhile experience. So that's really interesting, and you're also active in the uh, local startup community. So um, maybe you can give an idea of what it means to be part of a startup community, what that feels like, how people get involved. Uh, uh, you know, what are entrepreneurs doing in your region? and how you can help them uh, in their sort of journey. Sure. So, you know, I live in a, a city uh, named Edmonton in the Canadian province of Alberta. Um, I think we are probably best known for a large mall, but, uh, and, and uh, maybe a hockey team, but that's about it. Um, I would say that the startup community here is, is fairly nascent. Um, you know, th there's, a good number of grassroots initiatives. Um, there are some um, initiatives that have been financed by uh, government bodies, but largely it's a, a growing uh, ecosystem. Now, you know, for me, that means that uh, I can act as a, um, a bit of a thought leader. Um, there are uh, various organizations that bring me in to provide um lectures on on financing on how to uh, sort of access uh, VCs how to position yourself for a product market fit basically anything that you need to do to take um, some an idea to market um, and and you know address the personnel address uh, the financing address the uh, the technical requirements all along the way so it's been uh, an incredibly rewarding experience, um, and I'm hopeful that uh, the ecosystem here will sort of increase in in its uh, stature, and um, you know maybe can rival a Toronto, Vancouver someday. And what kind of companies do you think are are really interesting, uh, or startups that are really interesting in your area? So. 
the University of Alberta has some world-class research, um, particularly in the AI uh, sector. Um, Rich Sutton, whom I'm sure you know, Dr. Rich Sutton, is uh, you know a, a world-renowned researcher, and there is um, a, a body sort of connected to uh, the U of A um, named Amy, which is intended to uh, sort of commercialize and, and further develop some of this research coming out of uh, the region. That's some, some really interesting stuff uh, there. Um, locally, there's a lot of marketplaces and, um, you know, um, B2C type uh, companies. Um, you know, it, it's interesting stuff. But uh, further down the road in Calgary, uh, there have been a, a number of unicorns that have uh, developed over the last few years. Um, and Calgary is a, a great uh, example of, of a, you know, a growing ecosystem that has reached a, a certain level of maturity. Um, and, you know, there, there's some in, interesting companies, uh, such as Benevity, um, you know, social impact company, Unicorn, um, although they've had some, some challenges, as has the rest of, uh, you know, the world in, in recent years. But, um, you know, just um, some, some uh, great innovation coming out of Alberta uh, these days. So you're also part of something called um, AI for Good and the Innovation Factory. Can you can you describe your role there? Sure. So just um, as as I'm sure you know, the AI for Good uh, movement was started a, a number of years ago, um, and is is probably the uh, the foremost um, AI conference, uh, particularly um, in terms of impact uh, in the world today. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, the sort of innovation, uh, startup, uh, 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 prize has, has been, um, developed, uh, to bring together some of the most, um, promising AI companies from around the world. Uh, there is, uh, a set of judges that, um, assess these, these companies and then pass them along to me for, for, um, assessment, due diligence, and potential investment, which is fantastic. I mean, you know, we at Reds get to cherry pick some of the best innovation in the world, uh, take a deep dive, and then develop relationships with these founders as they move along um, in their journey. You know, in the past two weeks, I've seen some incredible innovation across the uh, the medical space in particular. Um, a company out of uh, South Korea that has um, developed some x-ray technology that facilitates the diagnosis of uh, osteoporosis. And then um, a company out of uh, Colorado, which has um, also developed an AI uh, engine to help um, uh, OBGYNs uh, address um, preterm birth, which is, uh, you know, something that, that is uh, near and dear to my heart. So that's interesting. And uh, you mentioned due diligence. What does that mean? Due diligence means, uh, well, <laughs> it is absolutely anything and everything that you need to assess about a company prior to making an investment decision. So it runs the gamut from uh, doing a deep dive into the company's financials, their projections, uh, their their product, um, how you see the uh, the product fitting into the current market, how the market will grow, how the market uh, presents itself globally uh, now and and you know five ten years into the future, um, all of the sort of legal aspects of of uh, the company creation, ensuring that there are no skeletons in the closet, um, and. I think perhaps most importantly, it's an assessment of the founders and uh, their willingness to do whatever it takes to make a company succeed. Um, you know, I, I think this is something that is uh, perhaps a little bit um, understated, but, um, you know, company founders can make or break uh, an enterprise very quickly. Um, you know, we've seen with with our companies, um, you know, we, we've got some some fantastic founders and they have uh, the ability to push um, through whatever adversity presents itself. 
um, to make sure that, uh, you know, their enterprise grows, succeeds, and by extension makes us look good. So then what would you be your recommendation? Let's, let's say I'm at a university and I think, hey, I've got this great idea. How do I convert that idea into something that can be commercialized and sustainable and will grow? And then I guess the corollary of this is what are the things you specifically look for? So you mentioned on the due diligence side, some things you look for, but if you were advising that that uh, translational research, translational meaning taking research and being able to use something useful out of it, but they have this idea, what advice would you give them as to the stages of uh, how to become a really successful unicorn uh, entrepreneur? <laughs> Wow, oh, man, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I would first assess, take a very common sense approach to to what you are trying to accomplish. Does this idea that you have make sense? Do you foresee people, companies, um, governments using whatever you intend to develop? If so, um, move on and um, try your best to um, to make an MVP, a uh, minimum viable product. The uh, the very bare bones uh, that that sort of demonstrates whether or not uh, your idea can actually uh, come to life. Um, I would go out um, and gather as much information as I can about uh, the particular market I'm intending to address. Um, try to get yourself in front of as many potential clients as possible to get their assessments um, and really hone in on the, the strengths and weaknesses of uh, your particular uh, idea. Thereafter, um, you know, you again, you, you, you try to gather as much intelligence as you can before finally saying, yes, I think I've got an idea that will work. Um, I'm going to incorporate uh, some sort of body through which to do business. I'm going to try to raise money. I'm going to try to uh, get my first clients and uh, and make a business out of this. But, you know, first and foremost, use your common sense. I see. Now, um, you, you are... Um part of something called Reds Capital. Now, what are some of the roles that you perform with Reds Capital? And, and what do those roles mean? <laughs> <laughs> I am uh, chiefly CEO um, slash COO of, of, of Reds. Um, I am also the fund manager of our first fund, which has been doing some incredible things. And um, I'm also our due diligence lead. So I wear a number of hats with Reds. Um, you, you know, we look for innovation that will fundamentally change the world across borders. We look for impact investments that will help uh, social, financial, environmental causes, um, that, and that will really uh, make a change across uh, the globe. Um, you know, in my sort of CEO work, I uh, address all manner of uh, investor concerns, uh, communication. Um, I, uh, I correspond with our companies on a very regular basis, provide uh, updates to our group and um, the sort of the larger world, um, and uh, as well deal with all uh, of our service providers. Um, due diligence sort of explains itself. I. I was uh, in the trenches with um, a number of our, our younger associates at the time, um, performing due diligence on all of our companies, making sure that uh, each one of them had the potential to to do very well at the uh, on a global stage and, and uh, to make our investors um, very good return. And um, and again, uh, you know, we also looking for impact. Um, so, you know, that's sort of uh, my role in, at Reds in a, a nutshell. And then what do you hope to do in, in the future? Like you're, you're seeing the evolution of, of your work and you're involved in investments and you're also a general partner. And, and maybe you could explain what, what sort of the structure of, of a typical institutional investor. Uh, and that's to separate it from um, like a angel investor. In fact, 
let's go back here uh, or give some more context. What are the different kinds of investors that are out there and what makes them different? Sure. So, you know, as you are starting a business, um, you will go through various rounds of, of financing. Um, at the very first stage, when you've got the kernel of an idea and perhaps you've, you've done some research, um, the first folks that you will want to uh, approach for, for money um, are, are family and friends. You know, those people that have um, hopefully learned about your journey along the way and, and have some sort of uh, idea as to uh, what you want to accomplish. Um, typically, these folks are investing on you based on the relationship that they've had with you for a long time. And they're, they're, it's almost sort of a, a blind faith um, investment. You know, there are various motivations. And, you know, I, I can't paint everybody in the family and friends around with the same brush. But typically, they are people you've known for a while, and they are investing you or in you as a person. Um, thereafter, you move on to uh, the angel stage, and typically, this is a person of some means um, that uh, either does uh, investing as a a solo um, person on a you know on an ad hoc or on a professional basis. Um, typically it is a smaller check and there is some diligence that is done. The, uh, the degree to which, uh, sort of varies person by person. So again, you, you know, I, I don't want to, um, paint everybody, um, uh, with the same brush, but, uh, you will as an investor, as an entrepreneur have to endure some form of questioning, uh, typically at least a meeting or two. Um, and you will actually have to present yourself in a professional way. Um, and then finally, you move on to institutions, and there's a wide range of, of institutional investors. So I'm, I'm specifically going to uh, address what we do at REDS, which is uh, early stage venture capital. Um, you know, it, it's uh, a, a point at which you encounter a professional investor. Um, you know, you are going to... Um, as an entrepreneur, you're going to have to be polished. You are going to have to be prepared to um, deal with a number of meetings, some very pointed questioning, and uh, at least one or two site visits, um, and perhaps some some client contact as well. So, you know, again, what we are looking for is the uh, the full range of financial, legal. Uh, management, uh, product, technical due diligence, um, and we will get down to uh, exactly what makes you as a company and, and what uh, we believe will make you succeed or, you know, perhaps not succeed in the future. And and let's say um, you mentioned uh, early stage venture capital, uh, which is a kind of institutional investor. Um, and they... Let's go on beyond that uh, and maybe sort of your view of when do uh, private equity investors get involved and and uh, sovereign funds get involved and things like that. So, Sure. So, it, you know, it's really a function of how much capital you have under management and, and you know, the um, the attitude of, of those in charge. Um, sovereign funds can um, they, they can participate in a, a, a very a uh, big way um, with established cash flowing businesses. Um, and, you know, they're, they're happy to, um, to, to make, uh, you know, perhaps less, but uh, have that sort of risk taken off the table. Um, you know, Saudi funds, for example, they, they have a, a enormous uh, sovereign uh, fund. Um, in, in Canada, we've got uh, BDC, which plays at, at all different levels. Um, you know, they've uh, co-invested in, in one of our companies that, that uh, was a, you know, relatively early stage enterprise, but, uh, you know, they also go in at, at uh, much later stages uh, where, again, risk has been taken off the table. Um, PE funds typically invest in, in operating entities that uh, have, you know, solid cash flow and, um, you know, they're, they're, they're just operate they're, they're investing in operating businesses that um you know again take a good amount of risk off the table and uh provide steady returns 
So why would anybody want to uh, invest at the venture capital or angel investing stage if, if there is higher risk? Why not just stay at the PE and sovereign fund level where, where you say, uh, you know, risk is mitigated somewhat? Sure. So, you know, at, at the PE level, your check sizes are enormous, um, you know, multi millions, if, if not uh, billions of dollars. Um, whereas, you know, an angel or an early stage VC can come in with, with you know, check sizes of, of less than, you know, two, three million dollars um, at very low valuations and um, really take that that uh, sort of risk reward matrix um, at its, you know, lowest, lower level of, of, um, of, of, of uh, potential uh, exit. Um, but, you know, the, the reward is, is tremendous. The reward potential is tremendous, I should say. Um, the, the risk is, is there, absolutely. But it's, it's really for people that have um, the financial wherewithal to undertake those risks and understand that uh, the, if you find the right team, the right technology, the right marketplace, and the right opportunity, um, the rewards are, are absolutely tremendous. Um, there is nowhere else in the world where you can, you know, do uh, twenty thousand x. Um, you know, you just can't achieve that in public markets, real estate, any other form of investment um, is is uh, you know it, it's impossible to achieve those types of returns um, unless you're willing to take the risk uh, that is uh, presented in VC. So you also mentioned uh, valuation. What does that mean? Valuation is uh, how a company or how uh, external investors value a company. So, you know, typically at an early stage, um, it's very it's it's less of a science um, because there are no um, financial metrics by which to assess a, a company. Um, so, it, you know, it, it's, it's, um, you know, more of an art and, you know, relatively speaking, the, the numbers are low, um, less than $10 million, um, simply because the company hasn't achieved anything. And then as you progress, you've got all sorts of, uh, ways to value a company, um, that are, are uh, accepted by, by, uh, markets worldwide. But, uh, you know, at that early stage, it's, um, you know, it, Again, the uh, the reward is is there if you are willing to undertake that risk. So, what is the nature of uh, uh, investing today? But I guess it would vary by region, right? And so, what are what are what's your pers uh, perspective of investments in different regions around the world? And then, what's your perspective of investing in different parts of the world? And then, where do you think it's going to go? Sure. So, you know, I, I think everybody is still um, recovering, I, I, I want to say, a little bit from the COVID uh, sort of FOMO um, era where um, valuations were, were uh, a little bit outsized, um, particularly uh, these days in a, um, a high interest rate environment. Um, you know, some of the more conservative uh, investors are, are looking to, uh, to to more fixed income products, uh, just because you know the the um, the ability to take you know a couple of uh, percent wasn't there a number of years ago, um, and you know to that end, uh, investment sort of across uh, North America, Europe, um, Middle East. Uh, Israel um, and Asia has sort of cooled. Um, valuations are, are coming down uh, across the board. Um, and VCs are, are holding on to their money um, a little bit. They are looking for certain places to deploy. Um, AI um, in general is still holding somewhat strong, um, although I, I think that... Uh, the generative wave has somewhat cooled. Um, you know, not everybody can attach uh, a, a generative tag to 
whatever they're doing and, and expect, you know, giant checks coming their way anymore. I think people are starting to understand that uh, there's a distinction between generative AI that actually does something versus um, slapping a, a, a name on a company and, and squinting, making sure to, just to, to see that uh, it actually might have a, a, a small link. But, um, you know, I think in, in the future, um, investors are going to be a little bit, uh, perhaps a little bit more cautious um, and will uh, think twice before really making, you know, significant bets. So are you saying then that um, there's sort of a, a downturn on the investment side? And, and are you saying also that um, investors are looking for more old fashioned, or I should say more classical measures before getting involved, for example, growing revenue, things like that, and not taking that sort of chance where the revenues are smaller. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. I, I think, you know, uh, moving forward, um, folks are going to, to want to see products in market. Uh, as you said, uh, revenue generation, uh, perhaps some client stickiness, but really anything that um, any indicator that a company is a, a viable entity moving forward, as opposed to the mere promise um, that, that we were seeing a number of years ago where, where you know, investors were writing checks uh, simply to not miss the boat, so to speak. Right. And that's where you mentioned FOMO and some of the audience may not know what FOMO means, right? So fear of missing out. And so you sort of jump on the bandwagon. Now, in terms of what are some of the trends that you're seeing globally? Because, you know, you, you're um, mentoring and you're part of this innovation factory, which has seen AI deployments worldwide and solutions. What do you think are some of the hot areas that uh, are interesting to you uh, going into the future? And future is a big word. So that could be like, sure. two, it could be like the end of this year. Or it could be by 2025 or 2030. Do you have some feeling of what some of the big trends are? Um, you know, I'll, I'll sort of redirect and say, you know, something that's been particularly interesting to me has been the adoption of AI um, at a, a large scale. Um, you know, almost everybody knows what chat gpt is you know in this day and age and and uh, they have some conception of what what uh, gen ai means um i think what is particularly interesting is the adoption of small pieces within um traditionally sort of uh, inner industries uh legal accounting real estate um there is the um the understanding that uh, adoption of of you know small pieces can help you, um, and you know these are, are industries that perhaps have relied on human arrogance, human ingenuity for for you know hundreds of years, um, and you know traditionally have held the belief that the human is is always. Uh, a, a a vital uh, in the loop component, and, and that is that will remain true. However, there are certain ways that uh, one can increase productivity using um, AI products that that you know typically will not harm uh, your 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 bottom line. In fact, it'll make you more productive. Um, and you know, interestingly as, as well, um, there are certain just. Uh, things that that I've seen in in music, for example, um, that uh, have really sort of made me question uh, the 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 uh, the human ingenuity and, and whether or not we are truly as special as we believe uh, ourselves to be. Um, I think another thing that is going to be particularly interesting moving forward is uh, impact investing. Um, you know, for a number of years, uh, you know, the, some of the leaders across the world have, have pushed ESG, um, the, the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, as, as sort of these principles to, to strive uh, to reach. Um, and I think, you know, that, that, that's great at a very high level. Um, 
perhaps uh, translating that down to uh, an individual company or uh, even an in individual level has not quite been there for, for the past number of years. However, um, with you know a number of companies that I'm seeing right now, um, impact and, and true measurable impact has been at the forefront of, of what uh, they have been doing. Um, you know, it, it's it's uh, in my estimation, it's just as meaningful to uh, act on an individual level um, if you don't have, you know, the, the platform that, uh, you know, some of these conglomerates have, um, all the while making sure that uh, what whatever action you're undertaking has some sort of environmental, social, financial impact that, that can improve lives um, around the world. So I think you know that is uh, something that that we will consider um, and uh, and prize moving forward. Um, and you know, just as a on a personal note, um, I think uh, environmental um, investing has really seen um, a rise in, in the past number of years. Carbon capture, uh, alternative energy, um, efficiency, um, even within sort of traditional industries, has uh, really seen um, an upswing. So I'm I'm hopeful that uh, that will continue. As uh, you know, we we all want to leave this planet in a, a much better state uh, than than we found it. So let's unpack just a little bit about some of the things you talked about. You talked about Gen I, uh, AI or generative AI, and that's a really big term. So uh, there's probably a, a more umbrella term kind of large foundation models of which you then yeah. have generative AI. An example of generative AI would then be large language models, uh, which would be the chat GPT or uh, you have uh, fusion models, which would be this uh, like Dolly to these graphic or mid journey and so on. And then you you talked about this aspect of music and you said, um, you know, perhaps this creative uh, aspect of humans of music and it could be poetry and or writing scripts. Uh, I think you're alluding to the fact that this uh, large language models, these generative AI models, these large foundation models, Maybe they can do music. Maybe maybe they can write poetry. Um, maybe they can write prose in a way that we used to think only uh, authors and other people who are very creative could do that. And then I, I guess then by extension, what you're saying is, you know, when you look at Mid Journey and Dali 2 and some of these other, um, in fact, even in Adobe now, um, these things can create art, <laughs> which used to be, the purview of human beings, right? We used to think, oh no, I mean, the only human beings can do that kind of thing. But now you're having AI being able to generate that. So is that the sort of the context you're thinking of that we're getting to this realm where things that we used to think only creatives could do, we thought only humans were creative. Now AI is actually in those areas. And then I guess by extension then, do you think we'll have something called AG, artificial general intelligence, which is much more human-like capabilities? It may not be human, it may be another kind of intelligence, but where it equals even surpasses humans. So so, uh, so, additional questions on kind of this theme of generative AI. Yeah, no, that, that, that's, you know, it's, it's very interesting. Um, you know, I, I think... As humans, you know, we, we do need to provide some source material from which these uh, large language models can learn and, and you know, can sort of base their their uh, their synthesis um, upon. However, um, it's it's a little bit, um, you know, it, it's sort of frightening to see uh, the, the speed at which some of these these models are being developed. And, um, you know, if you had told me that, uh, you know, for example, I, I listened to a, a, um, a song that was uh, entirely an AI creation from uh, reportedly, um, you know, two very significant artists, I would have believed you, but it was entirely the product of AI. Um, so, you know, I, I, and, you know, to address your, your uh, AGI question, I, absolutely. I, I do think that uh, we will see a, a higher level of, um, of artificial intelligence in the very near future. Um, perhaps it won't be entirely human, um, but it will be, you know, human-like 
enough that uh, you know we can sort of tailor our own personal uh, AGIs to our preferences. So you know, I'll tell my uh, my personal assistant, oh, I want to listen to this today, or and then it'll predict you know what I want to listen to tomorrow or um, you know, what I need to do uh, to, to address any work concerns in the next day or two. Um, and you know, we at, at REDS are sort of at the forefront of, of uh, some of these innovations. We've got um, uh, a company out of uh, Korea, um, Mind, for example. Um, they are leading the third wave of, um, of uh, AI models. Um, with a, a reasoning engine that um, really pierces through the black box of some of these large language models. It provides um, a, a full accounting of how and, and why certain conclusions were reached, um, which uh, is a key step to uh, to making uh, AGI a um, you know a, a reality. I guess then um, there's this idea of. Do you see this going into our entertainment side as well, like beyond music, but into gaming? Um, what's your perspective of AI? And, and uh, you know, Apple came out with their Vision Pro product. And what are the implications to the gaming marketplace of all of this techno, uh, tech innovation that's happening? Oh, it's huge. It, it, it is tremendous. <laughs> you know, I'm a, a, a small scale gamer myself. Um, so I have some grounding in in uh, you know some of the uh, the top tier um, titles, and you know I can absolutely foresee some um, some real transformational work that uh, can help some of these these AAA titles um, pump out games faster, um, you know use their resources more efficiently, um, and you know again at Reds we are ideally positioned to, uh, to to help propel that that uh, movement forward um our company yume has uh, developed um its own uh, sort of gaming engine that uses um generative ai to uh to, to greatly expedite the character creation um and, and sort of background um, um sort of backdrop uh, generation um in a, a you know hyper efficient manner um and in a style that uh completely syncs with uh the, the style of a um, you know a premier game and then gaming you know do you think it's going to become more photorealistic and and do you see it coming to the point where you can't tell in a game whether it's uh, cgi computer generated or whether it's like a per it seems like a real person in there. Do you think it's going to move into that realm in the near term? And and do you see the tech then that um, extending into animation, animation becoming photorealistic, and then even uh, live action movies really being generated totally by computers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know <laughs> the capability is there. Um, you know it's it's uh, purely a stylistic decision at this point, but the capability is there. And again, Hume is at the forefront of of this this movement. Um, you know they've got the ability to um, to to insert completely photorealistic characters, backgrounds um, into existing titles. Um, you know what they they need to do now to sort of match uh, the demands of the industry is, is sort of scale down, which you know, it, it, at a, a high level is a much easier problem to address than scaling up. Um, so, you know, when um, the, these entertainment uh, titans are ready for photorealism, you will be ready to uh, address all of their needs. You know, we're so used to uh, working with digital assistants, right? We We speak into our phones and the phone answers back or uh, different desktops and so on. Do you see that changing into uh, human kind of avatars that look like humans and they can respond in English to your queries and and then uh, you in turn can ask questions of any kind and, and it's like having a chat. Is that really far off or do you think that's already occurring? No, I, I think that's, you know, that, that's very close. Um, you know, it, it'll uh, sort of depend on your, your preferred uh, method of consumption. 
um, whether it's on the phone or whether it is, uh, you know, in, in the, uh, the Vision Pro, for example. But uh, these personalized assistants are, are not too far off. Um, you know, it, it's scary, some of the, the um, information that uh, Siri, for example, which, you know, isn't particularly sophisticated, um, but, uh, you know, it, it's scary the amount of information that, uh, you know, it, it can sort of provide me um, and sort of uh, project for me um, right now. Can you think of any uh, chat agent providers out there right now? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I I referenced Mind earlier. Um, that you know they, they've got a, a great system um, that is is set up across uh, Thailand, across India, ba basically across Southeast Asia. Um, another company that that comes to mind uh, in particular is uh chat uh, or did um and and its um product uh, chat uh did it is a um you know an avatar that uh you know utilizes gen ai um and initially will act as a sort of a, a customer service agent um but as it progresses will hopefully uh, sort of evolve into a personalized AI that uh, everybody can take around with them. Yeah, and perhaps in the future, if I do another interview with you, it'll actually be a mock-up, an artificial version of Jeff, but infused with <laughs> who you are. So I won't be able to tell. Do you think that's going to be happening in the next few years? It's entirely possible. And, you know, you could do the same thing. You could interview multiple people at the same time and uh, they would, you know, all be infused with your uh, magnificent brain power. Um, and, you know, you can just sort of expand your your global footprint, um, you know, in, in a uh, in an efficient way, all using companies maybe like DID. So, Jeff, uh, you've given us a perspective of the future, and it sounds quite optimistic. Uh, then is your viewpoint quite optimistic about the future, even though there's challenges? You know, there's aspects of polarization and climate change and so on. But in the long term, do you think this idea of tech for good will be the winner for us? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we as humans, we create the tech um, and, you know, we can guide it. We can set boundaries around its utilization. Of course, there are always going to be bad actors. But, you know, by and large, I think um, those that that uh, are in positions of, of power, authority, um, have the best interests of, of uh, humanity at heart. And, uh, and we'll act in, in our collective best interests. Um, you know, as, as investors, we can help support that by um, placing a particular emphasis on, on, again, social, environmental, financial impact, inclusion, um, to make sure that, that um, you know, everybody is lifted by technology and, and, and not, um, you know, just those that, that are in a position to sort of advantage themselves. And I guess I'll just have a couple more questions. You know, something that's underlying the fabric of everything we live in are chip technology. And in fact, my phone has a bionic chip in it. And the next generation will have probably 20 billion transistors and can do 20 trillion operations per second. That's a supercomputer in your hand. And it's optimized for AI. Do you, and really uh, chips enable everything else, right? They're built into everything, your cars, your appliances, your phones, your computers, they're everywhere. Do you think that underlying infrastructure technology is something that you think is really exciting as well, where it's going to go into the future? And do you think it's going to propel things like quantum computing and even fusion energy systems to new kinds of AI, to biological replacements or or um, robots and robotic replacements for human beings or companions, uh, uh, like assistants, I should say. Do you think that the underlying chip fabric is going to improve dramatically as well? Absolutely, yes. Um, you know, I think, um, so there's a saying, what, what's what's old is, is new again. Um, and, you know, at Reds, we've got um, a company that, uh, is doing exactly that. Um, it, it's a company named uh, 
analog computation enterprise, and um, they are uh, in the process of developing an analog chip um, using, you know, their own um, AI algorithms. Um, analog chips are, are you know, a, a, an old technology. Um, it, you know, the the, uh, the tech has been around for, for you know, uh, decades, but, you know, it has fallen out of favor um, or had fallen out of favor uh, due to the the uh, the rise of digital, which provides an approximation, but perhaps not a um, uh, a precise answer. Um, analog provides a precise answer to whatever uh, problem it is addressing. Um, the challenge had, had been the fact that uh, it took far too long for for this um, the the analog process to occur. Um, uh, analog computation enterprise ACE for short has developed a method by which uh, it can perform these calculations um, either at the same speed or, or faster than than digital um, chips, meaning that uh, you know it can address um, NP complete problems, uh, those problems that are, are far too complex. Uh, for for digital chips to address the, the traveling salesman is a great example. Um, you know the the implications for this are, are tremendous. Um, anything from weather prediction to financial modeling to um, uh, to to um, logistics, um, anything and everything under the sun um, that that relies on on computation power, even quantum. Um, can be supplemented by uh, the the, um, the the ACE model. Um, you know, we're really excited about uh, where the company is is going right now. It's uh, addressing uh, a gas lift problem um, in the oil and gas industry. Now, this the gas lift is a a, a method by which um, within oil wells. Uh, gas is pumped into um, the, the chamber, so to speak, to increase yield. Um, however, you know, because all of these these oil fields are, are interconnected, um, it, you know, th there is impact on you know all of the the uh, the wells in a field uh, when gas is inserted into one chamber, um, and you know, current uh, digital tech. Uh, tops out at about 50 um, wells before the, the problem becomes too much for, for the system to bear. Um, analog is, is unlimited in that respect. So, you know, very shortly they will be uh, rolling out uh, the results of a, a first uh, POC and we expect some, some, you know, strong adoption, which will serve as a, um, sort of a first market entree for, for ACE and, uh, you know, the, the reintroduction of analog um, to the world. In a you know, you mentioned this uh, MP kind of problems. Uh, can, can you describe that in more detail? Maybe people don't really understand what that means. Are, are you talking about problems that can be solved normally and, and it just uh, takes a little bit more time? Are you talking about problems that are so difficult um, that, they can't be solved on classical computers. It just it, we're considered impossible. And then this traveling salesman, people don't know what that means. What, what do you mean by traveling salesman? Sure. So, you know, the, the latter is exactly correct, Stephen. It is an NP complete problem is, is something that is so complex that has so many different factors that uh, a, a conventional computer cannot reasonably uh, solve it in a, a you know, commercially reasonable time frame. Um, the traveling salesman problem um, is, is um, you know, classical NP complete problem. For example, you've got a salesman that has to visit a hundred different cities, um, and you uh, want to find the most optimal route for this salesperson. It, it, it's impossible uh, using uh, conventional computing. However, analog can give you the most optimal in a, con uh, a commercially reasonable time frame, um, and you know this will uh, facilitate all sorts of. of um, innovation in you know how businesses how people operate so jeff when i when i hear you talk about that it sounds like you're a tech expert now 
<laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm doing my best. Um, you know, what I really enjoy about uh, being in VC is the fact that I'm learning um, every day. I get to interact with, you know, the best and the brightest in the world. I get to learn from them, add to my own knowledge and, and, and um, you know, help, uh, you know, these people make impact or impacts across the world um, and, you know, really grow their, their businesses. It's interesting, Jeff, you know, at the beginning of this interview, you mentioned that you went into the law because it was kind of like the other outside of math and sciences. Now you're actually embracing math and sciences. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, we, we all have to to learn and, and evolve as, as uh, you know, as we grow to, to stay current. Um, you know, that's the, you know, particularly with, with what we're doing in, in the tech world, you absolutely have to stay on top of the, the most recent innovation to, to ensure that you don't miss anything. So it sounds like that's a little bit of a, a success and career advice to others, right? The, sort of embrace the boundaries of your knowledge and keep stretching or what we call stretch goals. Uh, Jeff, this is down to our last question. What, what recommendations would you like to give to our audience? Um, you know, I'm a big proponent of, of, of lifelong learning. It, you know, we, you just sort of uh, referenced it there, but um, you know, always uh, sort of continue to to learn, be curious, um, and and try to try your best to to sort of leave any situation you encounter in a, in a, a better place than, than than where you found it. Uh, you know, impact is is at the very core of of what we do. Um, every single one of, of our partners lives and breathes impact uh, through, you know, our actions. And, um, you know, we, we really hope um, with our, our future goals to, uh, you know, to, to make a meaningful uh, change, you know, in, in the world today and in the future. Well, Jeff, uh, thank you for coming in, sharing so much uh, of your insights. And, you know, we did it for an hour, which is a considerable amount of dialogue on these different topic areas. So uh, you have a great uh, career. You're continuing to make global contributions. So thank you for coming in and sharing so much with our audience. Thank you for having me, Stephen. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.